Okay, that was exactly 20 minutes. I'm joking, it was more than 20 minutes. Um, so let's see what your classmates thought about each question. Number one, why does the indentation change in stanza three? Let's take a look. Uh, some classmates said it's because of the rhyme. Ring jiao. So let's take a look at these rhymes. The first stanza lines one to four. The, the ending words are lance, prize, eyes, and France. So we call this rhyme, uh, rhyme structure ABBA. -B -A. Right, so lance and France are A, and prize and eyes are B. Second stanza, lines five to eight, advance, applies, rise, chance. This is also A, B, B, A. So the indentation is the same. That makes sense. What about the third stanza, lines 9 to 12? Take, this, make, is. Huh, the rhyme seems different. And it's a different sound from the first two stanzas. So that we would call this C, D, C, D. So yes. The rhyme scheme does change, and so maybe the form of the poem changes with the rhyme. But a bigger question is, why does the rhyme scheme change? Uh, does Is there a change in the meaning of the poem? So for this, we have to look at the actual poem. OK, here we go. Having this day, my horse, my hand, my lance. A lance is like a long stick to fight other people on horses. The verb is here, guided. Guided so well. So on this day, the subject is I. So on this day, I have guided my horse, my hand, and my lance so well that I obtained the prize. So he's participating in some kind of competition. Both by the judgment of the English eyes and of some scent from that sweet enemy, France. So this competition is being judged by both English and French people together. Um, and it calls France the sweet enemy because if you remember from last week, uh, England had spent more than 100 years at war with France. So even though now they're not at war, uh, still he calls them the sweet enemy. Well, because they're not at war, so they're sweet. OK, so he won the competition and both English and French people agree. That's the first stanza. Second stanza. Horsemen, my skill in horsemanship advance. Advance here means give as the reason. So everybody's thinking, why did he win? Why is he so good? Horsemen think it's because he's good at horses. Town folks, my strength. Uh, in between townsfolks and my, he has omitted everything that is similar in the previous sentence. So the full sentence should be, townsfolk think that I won because of my strength. Uh, and here the town folk are uh, the audience, people who are not nobles. A daintier judge, daintier on the right, it says more discerning. They, this person would understand more about the competition. A daintier judge applies his praise to slight. Slight here, it says art. Art means skill. Uh, applies his praise just means he, uh, he thinks the reason is uh, because of Astrophil's skill, which from good use doth rise. So where does he get his skill? From good use. Use means experience. So basically he got his skill from lots of practice. Some lucky wits imputed but to chance. Wit here means somebody with knowledge. Uh, impute means give as the reason. So some lucky people who have experienced luck 
think that Astrophil also won only because of luck. Chance here just means luck. So that's the second stanza. Different kinds of people all think that Astrophil won because of the thing that they themselves are good at. Right? Horse people think he's good at horses. Uh, people with knowledge of the competition think that he has good skill. Uh, people who are lucky think that he's lucky. Third stanza. Others, because of both sides, I do take my blood from them who did excel in this. Think nature, me a man of arms did make. Um, so the sentence is completely backward. Let me rearrange the sentence. Others think that nature made me a man of arms. Arms here means weapons. So in this competition, he's using a lance. Made me someone good with weapons. Because my blood um, takes from both sides of those who are good at this. So in modern English, it means uh, other people think that I was born to be good at fighting because both sides of my family come from people who are good at fighting. Uh, so let's do a, a more specific translation. My blood here means my bloodline, Xiemai. So his family, both sides, so father's side and mother's side. Excel in this, this is the competition, which is a kind of fighting, so is good at fighting. Uh, and nature made me a man of arms, right? Nature made me a good fighter. But there's still one more line. How far they shoot awry. Awry means wrong direction. So th all of their guesses are wrong. The true cause is. And that's the end of the third stanza. So is there a change in meaning? There is. First of all, uh, in the first two stanzas, uh, each line or each couple of lines contains a single idea. So the first two lines, he wins. The third line, the English people say he wins. The fourth line, the French people say he wins. Each line has a single idea. Second stanza, horsemen, town folks, a better judge, and lucky people. Again, each line has a single idea. But in the third stanza, the first three lines have one idea. Uh, the idea is that he was born a good fighter because of his uh, family. And then the fourth line starts to, uh, we call this the twist, give a completely different perspective. So yes, the meaning does change. And so maybe that's why the rhyme changes and that's why the indentation changes also. OK, let's uh, we have two lines left, so let's talk about these two lines. So why does Astrophil win? The true cause is Stella looked on. Stella was in the audience. And from her heavenly face sent forth the beams which made so fair my race. Race here means competition. So because he saw that Stella was in the audience and he saw her beautiful face, that face made his performance so good in this competition. So why did he win? Love. Um, so we're talking about the structure, the form of the sonnet. In Sydney, uh, he, his form is closer to the original Italian form. Sonnets came from Italy. Uh, in Italian, it's eight lines and then six lines. Eight plus six is 14, so the, the meaning of the first eight lines is supposed to be different from the meaning of the last six lines. Now, when Sidney wrote his sonnets, you can still tell that there is a separation between the first eight and the last six. 
but he pushes the twist later in the poem to the last two or three lines. So yes, the meaning starts to change in line nine, but we really get the new perspective in line 11 or at the end of line 10. So this is the beginning of what we call the English sonnet. Uh, next week we're going to read sonnets by Shakespeare, and he really does this. Instead of eight and six, he does uh, 12 and I forgot, is it 10 and four or 12 and two? But anyways, the twist is pushed uh, later. Question two. Why do you think Astrophil calls Stella unkind in Sonnet 47? Unkind actually has two meanings. Uh, the current meaning in modern English is somebody who is not kind, not nice. But kind in the older meaning is family. So unkind can mean uh, different from me, we're not the same. Uh, and depending on the scale, can guimo, sometimes it can mean not human. So here, line 13, unkind, I love you not. <gasps> why? Doesn't he love her? So to understand why, we have to look at the whole poem. Um, a couple of groups did choose this question, and they managed to understand what's going on by the end. So what, again, what is not a question? What is an interjection? Uh, in Chinese, it's kind of like, huh? What? Have I thus betrayed my liberty? I've given up my freedom? Can those black beams such burning marks engrave in my free side? Okay, so first of all, the black beams are Stella's eyesight. So when Stella looks at him, her eyes are black, so he calls these black beams. Beam is a, a, a ray of light, guangmang, yi dao guangmang. Burning marks engrave in my free side. So here he's talking about when somebody becomes a slave, bei nu yi. The owner or the master will burn their mark onto the side of the slave. So here he's saying that Stella has enslaved him. Or am I born a slave whose neck becomes such yoke of tyranny? Become means suit. Right on the right it says is suited to. A yoke is the thing that you put on a cow when you want the, the or the ox when you want the ox to plow the field. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. So like a uh, slave, right? So the master is treating him like an animal. Or want I sense to feel my misery? Want, as I said last week, means lack. Or do I lack sense to feel my misery? So in the first stanza, he's asking, like, why am I so easily enslaved? Do I not care about my own freedom? Uh, or sprite, sprite here, it says, means spirit. Disdain of such disdain to have. Does my spirit not care uh, about not caring about my freedom? So not only does he not care, he doesn't even care that he doesn't care. Who for long faith, though daily help I crave, may get no alms but scorn of beggary. So who means himself? He's talking about himself. Uh, for long faith, even though he has kept faith in God for so many years, even though I crave daily help, or I guess I daily I crave help. Crave means desperately want. So even though I ask for God, uh, ask God for help every day, I may get no alms but scorn of beggary. 
alms are what you give to, or what, in the past, what they gave to poor people. Like the money you give to a beggar is called alms. So here he's comparing himself to a beggar, right? I'm begging God for help, but he only gives me scorn, which means contempt. Okay, so the idea is, is still uh, the same, right? Stella has turned him into a slave with her eyes. But then we get to the third stanza and we, we get a new idea. Virtue awake. He's talking about himself, his virtue, his virtue originally meant courage. So like be brave. Beauty, but beauty is. It, but means only. So in English, you would say beauty is only beauty, nothing more. I may, I must, I can, I will, I do. Leave following that which is it is gained to miss. So he's encouraging himself to leave. Or leave means leave off, which means to stop, to, to, to uh, give up. Following what it is gained to miss. So he's encouraging himself to give up this love. Right, let her go. But then we have the twist. Soft, which means quiet. He's telling himself to be quiet. But here she comes. So just as he is uh, ready to leave this relationship, here Stella comes. Go to, which is an insult. In Chinese, we call this chutada. Unkind, I love you not. O oh, me that I doth make my heart give to my tongue the lie. So even though he's ready to leave, even though he tells her I don't love you, and yet his eye, the eye that sees her beauty, makes my heart give to my tongue the lie, which means he, his heart makes his tongue a liar. Uh, so even though he says he's going to leave, and yet his heart cannot leave. Question two, why does he call her unkind? Because to him, she makes him love her even though loving her is suffering and giving up his freedom. Which is a very male way of thinking of love. Let's take a short break.
Question three. In Sonnet 81, how serious do you think Astrophil is being and why? So let's take a look at Sonnet 81. O oh, kiss, which dost those ruddy gems in part. So ruddy means red. Uh, gems. Here he's talking about Stella's lips. Uh, in part, you can say it means give. You can also look at the root of the word and say it means separate. So a kiss separates her red lips. Or, and it says or means either. If there are, if there are, yeah, yeah, or means either. Either gems or fruits of newfound paradise. So here he's talking about how beautiful her lips are. Breathing all bliss, bliss means happiness and sweetening to the heart, teaching dumb lips a nobler exercise. Dumb means cannot talk. So if your lips don't talk, I, I can teach you something better to do with your lips. That seems not very serious, right? Seems like he's kind of joking, maybe maybe flirting. Uh, let's continue. Oh, kiss which souls, even souls, together ties by links of love. So a kiss can tie two souls together through love. Very romantic. And only nature's art, again, art means skill. Uh, how fain, which means gladly, right? I would very willing, how fain would I paint thee to all men's eyes. So I would love to be able to describe you to everyone and to let them really see how beautiful you are. Or of thy gifts, at least shade out some part. Shade out means sketch. So if I can't describe you very well, at least I want to try to make some kind of description of your gifts. Remember, he's talking about kissing. He wants to try to be able to describe the joy of kissing to the world. But she forbids. She, of course, is Stella. She forbids with blushing words, she says, she builds her fame on higher seated praise. So if she wants to be famous, she wants to be famous for something higher, not just kissing. But my heart burns, I cannot silent be. So like uh, kissing Stella is such a joyful thing that he must share it with the world. Then since, dear life, this is he's calling Stella his life. Then since, Stella, you fain would have me peace. Peace means keep quiet. So since you don't want me to talk about this, and I, mad with delight, want wit to cease. Mad means crazy. So I'm so crazily happy that I don't have the intelligence to stop talking about it. Uh, so there's only one thing I can do. Stop you my mouth with still, still kissing me. The only thing you can do to stop me is to keep kissing me, to prevent me from talking. So this poem is basically saying, I really love kissing Stella, she doesn't want me to say that, but I really want to share this with the world. So Stella, the only way to shut me up is to kiss me. So back to the question, how serious do you think Astrophil is being in this poem? Uh, I think it's pretty clear he's basically flirting with her. But flirting is also kind of serious, right? It's not completely fake. It's not completely joking. He really does love her. He really does love kissing her. Flirting is kind of like playing, playing a game. So in that sense, he's serious about the game of love in this sonnet. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, great. So next question. Uh, number four, how would you describe Astrophil's feelings in Sonnet 87? And why would you describe them like that? 87. So what is Astrophil feeling in this poem? When I was forced from Stella ever dear, ever means always. So he's saying he always loves his dear Stella. But he was forced away from her. Stella, food of my thoughts, heart of my heart. Uh, we still say this in English, right? Food for thought, uh, which means it's something you can think about. Food of my thought, heart of my heart. Stella, whose eyes make all my tempests clear. Tempest means a storm, but here he's talking about his emotions. When he's confused or angry, uh, Stella only has to look at him and he calms down. By iron laws of duty to depart. So he has to depart from Stella, leave her because of his duty, his job. Alas, which means I, I found that she with me did smart. Smart, it says, means suffer. So he found that Stella is also suffering because of this with me. So I'm sad, but look, she's also sad. I saw that tears did in her eyes appear. I saw that sighs, uh, right, to, to give a breath of sadness. I saw that sighs her sweetest lips did part. So the verb is here, part. A sigh parts her sweet lips. And her sad words my sadded sense did hear. So I'm sad, right? So my senses are also sad. They have been sadded. Flexible English. But my sad senses also heard sad words from Stella. For me, I wept to see pearls scattered so. So here pearls is talking about Stella's tears. So when he saw Stella crying, he also started crying. I sighed her sighs and wailed for her woe. Uh, you see this mark on top of the E? This means that normally you should not pronounce this syllable. But because the poem has to have 10 syllables, it's missing one. So you should pronounce it in the poem. You're with a good one. Wail means cry, sob, hao tao da ku. So she sighs, I sigh. She cries, I also cry. Yet, twist, swam in joy. Such love in her was seen. So yes, I'm sad, she's sad, I'm sad because she's sad. But then, why is she sad? Because she loves me. And that makes me very happy. Thus, while the effect most bitter was to me, so even though it's very uh, sad for me to see her crying like this, and nothing than the cause more sweet could be. And yet the cause of her sadness is very sweet to me. She's sad because she loves me. And the conclusion, I had been vexed if vexed I had not been. Vexed means troubled, upset, not happy. And it says would have been. I had been means I would have been. So this sentence in modern English is, at this point, if I were not sad, I would be sad. Uh, in Chinese, we would say, So, to go back to the question, how would you describe Astrophil's feelings? On the one hand, he's sad. But he's sad, so Stella becomes sad. And also, like Stella doesn't want him to go. And when he sees that she's sad, 
she's sad because she loves him and that makes him happy. So how does he feel both happy and sad? Happy because of being sad and sad because of being happy. It's two opposites together. At the same time. See, this is why I love poetry. Like this shit happens all the time in real life, but you it's hard to talk about unless you find somebody who writes something like this and puts it all together in a very clear way for 16th century people at least. OK, question five, aside from Astrophil and Stella, what other things bring these poems together? Why are they part of the same sonnet cycle? Um, so what are some similarities? Love, obviously, right? All three of the poems, all four of the poems we looked at are about love. But also, they are all from the male perspective. They're all from Astrophil's perspective. So what kind of love are we talking about? It's a guy's love for a girl. We only know how Stella feels when Astrophil notices, like in the last poem. He sees her crying, and that's how we know she loves him also. But in the early poems, right, Stella looked at me, so I won the contest. Does she love him? Who knows? Um, so that's something that also connects these poems. It's from the male point of view. Uh, and another thing could be the form of the poem, Xing Shi, right? We talked about in the first question. Four stanzas, every poem follows the same structure, every poem follows the same rhyme scheme. Um, even though sonnets are a relatively fixed form, um, different poets will have small variations or small changes. But in these four poems, it's basically the same. So that's how we can also tell that they fit together. What are some differences? Uh, well, some poems are more serious than others, right? We had the poem about kissing, which is not very serious. Uh, but then we also had the poem about the lovers parting, and that one was very serious. Another difference is that the early poems, Astrophil doesn't know whether Stella loves him, but near the end we get to the later poems, it's clear that she also does love him. Uh, so there's a kind of progression, uh, and so it's not just poems about the same thing, the order of the poems also matters. And then we have question six. Pick a poem, how can you tell it was written in the 16th century? So we have to go back and see what are we talking about in the 16th century. Let's see. Do any of these ideas fit the four poems we were talking about? English Renaissance humanism. So a focus also on people in the world. Yeah, I think that fits, right? We have Astrophil and Stella, these two people. He loves her. She maybe loves him. There's no, there's very little talk of God. There is still mention of religion, but it's not very frequent in these four poems. So that's also a sign of a beginning humanism, caring also about people in the world and not just related to religion. Uh, what else? Well, we can actually also uh, connect the first poem with the rule of Henry the Seventh. He was the guy that ended the War of the Roses. The War of the Roses came about because uh, England lost a war, a hundred years war with France. So in the first poem, it says English people and French people were judging the competition. How is that possible? Because they were not fighting each other. So it doesn't belong earlier. The earliest it could be is from the 16th century. Let's see, what else? Elizabeth I, cult of love and chivalry. So as the first powerful queen, Queen Elizabeth did not 
only rule with authority, she also ruled with love. The idea is her subjects were supposed to follow her because they love her, and so she's supposed to protect them because she's the queen mother. So the entire royal court is full of this idea of motherly love and romance and chivalry, qi si jing sen, how men should behave toward women, a kind of uh, spirit, a kind of politeness. And so, yeah, we see this in the poems also, right? It's all about love, um, but it's also about control. If you remember the second poem, Stella has turned Astrophil into a slave with love. So it's he follows her because he loves her, kind of like how English people follow Queen Elizabeth because they're supposed to love her. It's a political allegory. And of course, chivalry, right? The first poem is about a, a, a competition on a horse, so that also fits. Uh, the poems were, uh, well, of course, sonnets were a very important in the 16th century. All four poems are sonnets. Later in English literary history, people keep writing sonnets. People didn't stop after the 16th century, uh, but sonnets were most important in the 16th century. They were written in not blank verse, but they were written in iambic pentameter, wubu iyanggu which is the same as blank verse, except blank verse does not rhyme. Uh, so it's close. And then we have admiration of form. So people at the time really cared about the form of their literature, not just the ideas, but how do you present the ideas? So as we just said, all four poems follow the same form, the same meter, the same structure, the same shape. That's something that they really cared about. OK, so do you have questions about today's discussion? OK, um, some quick announcements before we move into uh, next week's topics. Right. So, you might remember that uh, we're going to be doing an EPT, English Proficiency Test, sometime this semester. This It's not necessarily week four. I checked with the department and they said it will be in this course, but we don't know which week. It'll be a surprise. Um, so if it's not week four, then I will use that time to introduce uh, the next week's thing. So like basically, I'll move things around to fit the EPT into the course. So it's um, just So this is not exactly correct. The order is correct, but the timing may be different. The second thing is, um, I mentioned that on week 14, we will not have class because I have something to do. Uh, but that means we have to make up this class. Um, I know that whatever time we choose, not everybody will be available. So we're just going to watch a movie. But I do hope that you will come and watch the movie because apparently there are people who walk around in the hallways to check if there's a class. And if they see me sitting there alone, there will be questions. Uh, so um, try to make time to come and watch the movie with me. Also, I pick pretty good movies, I think. So we have to decide uh, which day of the week. Um, OK, I'll give you three options. Uh, I don't know which week, 
but the day of the week, Shinjiji. Option one, Tuesday afternoon, fifth and sixth periods. Option two, Wednesday afternoon, fifth and sixth periods. Option three, Friday afternoon, fifth and sixth periods. Morning, third and fourth periods. Change you, it's also on this and this again. Ah, OK, so not that one. So two options. Yeah, I don't want you to skip linguistics. We buy G. Ah, OK, are you are you guys busy Wednesday afternoon? I have class eight and ninth. Oh wait, you mean today, like Friday afternoon, eighth and ninth? Well, we could, but do you guys really want to stay uh, until six? That's true. Uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, the, okay, so let's start over. The two options are Wednesday fifth and sixth, and Friday eighth and ninth. So I'll give you three seconds to think about it. OK, let's vote. Wednesday, fifth and sixth periods, please raise your hand. Let, let's call that eight people. OK. Friday, eighth and ninth periods, please raise your hand. OK, Wednesday. Um, let's see, 22. 29. Let's try for October 4th. I'll see if I can find a classroom that day. I'll, I'll let you guys know. OK, that's that was the announcements next week. Uh, please. Don't come to class because there's no class next week. Um, but the following week, uh, please read five sonnets by William Shakespeare. Great guy, Shakespeare. Love him. So let's talk about this Shakespeare guy. So Shakespeare is like the most important person in English literary history. First of all, because he writes great literature. But secondly, also because he contributed so much to the English language. He gave us many, many new words. He showed people how flexible the language can be, mixing suffixes and prefixes and word roots. Uh, and he also gave us some really, really good plays. His his sonnets are great, but his plays are awesome. Uh, we don't have time to read his plays in this class, but I am teaching Shakespeare Monday morning, and we read four plays in that class if you want to join us. Um, so in terms of his sonnets, he, write, uh, he started writing what we call the English sonnet, so if you remember today, Sydney sonnets were eight lines and six lines, one idea, another idea, and then a twist at the end. Shakespeare carried this even further. Um, also 14 lines, but now it's 12 lines and two lines. You can notice in the rhyme structure, I just happen to have notes on this version. So you can see, right, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, EFEF. -E All three stanzas have the same rhyme pattern, the same rhyme scheme. But then the last two lines are GG, a new line, a new rhyme. And when you read his sonnets, you will also see that the last two lines are where the twist happens. So you no longer have to worry too much about uh, the first eight and the last six. It's now the first 12 and the last two lines. Another great thing about Shakespeare's sonnets is that um, a lot of them are about love, but not all of them. He starts talking about other subjects, 
And in fact, when he does talk about love, it's not always about love. Like we just read a poem about how Astrophil was enslaved because he loves Stella, so it's actually about politics. Kind of like that. Shakespeare uses the traditional love poem to talk about so many other things. Death, fame, progenity, which means children. Um, like lots of big ideas that people really start to think about once they reach middle age. Shakespeare was like 30 something at this time. Um, so you can look forward to that. Uh, but one thing that you should uh, know about Shakespeare is that because he has contributed so much to the English language, sometimes it's not very easy to understand. His use of language is more flexible, which means that you have to pay more attention to related meanings of words. So like when we think of the meaning of a word, we often think, oh, it's what it says in the dictionary. But that's only the first layer of meaning. Every word carries with it the history of the word. So when a word had older meanings, or other meanings, those meanings may also still have to do with how the word is used in the poem. A word always carries with it its older or other meanings, the history of the word. So if the immediate sense does not make sense, if the dictionary definition does not make sense, think about some other meanings of specific words. OK, that's Shakespeare. Uh, if we do do the EPT in week four, that means I also have to introduce the next literary period. So next week, no class. Next, next week, Shakespeare. The following week, we have ended the 16th century. and We're now going on to the 17th century. So let's talk about this. The 17th century begins when Elizabeth I dies and James I becomes king of England. Now, James I is not new to this king business. He was the king of Scotland under the name James VI before ascending to the English throne. Now, at this point, England and Scotland are two different countries. When James becomes king of England, he does not combine England and Scotland. He is at the same time king of two different countries. He tried. He tried to combine them and he, it didn't work. One reason it didn't work is because uh, Scotland is Catholic, but England is Protestant. So Scotland is the Catholic and England is the English Church, which is the Church. And at that time, different religion means different politics. People really were scared that if you're Catholic, you follow the Pope and you won't obey the king. So really, people really cared about this at that time. Um, so one way that James tried to keep control of his country in England is by insisting that the king is always right. Now at this time, there was already parliament. And parliament has some power. But according to James, that power was given parliament by the king. So basically, he's the biggest guy. Uh, and again, not everybody agreed, but when people disagreed, the conflict was not that big yet. The conflict gets bigger later in the 17th century. Actually, with Zijie Toto, why does it end in 1660? Because the Civil War begins in 1642 and it ends in 1660. One reason for the Civil War is the idea that the king is the biggest guy. You have to listen to the king and Parliament did not like that. We'll talk about that in like 10 minutes. Um, what else is happening under James I? Lots of spending. He tried to control his country to exert power. One way he did that was by, uh, we call this an ostentatious display of wealth. 炫富. 
by spending lots of money on parties and like events, he's showing people that he is the person in control. And also maybe he was gay. Not quite sure about that. Um, there are some movies about James I that kind of show maybe why he was gay, but at the time there was not a language for this, so we don't have a historical source. But it's possible. Um, so because he's Catholic uh, and England is Protestant, when he came to power in 1603, some people thought that this would be the doom of England. We must stop him. And so some nobles, members of parliament, important people tried to kill him in what is now called the gunpowder plot. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Led by a guy named Guy Fox. And their idea was when King James goes to Parliament to give a speech, they would dig a tunnel under the Parliament building, fill it with gunpowder, and just blow the whole thing up. Fortunately, they were stopped. Somebody uh, gave away the secret. Everybody was arrested and killed. But it was the closest uh, that England had gotten to a royal assassination. Uh, so even today, they celebrate November 5th. They call it Guy Fox Day. Uh, they take a picture of Guy Fox and they burn it in a bonfire and they have a barbecue. In 1607, the first colony was established in North America. So remember, after 1588, England defeated the Spanish Navy. They also became a powerful naval power. They started exploring the world and they set up a colony Zimingdi, in North America in 1607 in what is today Jamestown, Virginia. In 1611, the East India Company gains a foothold in India. The East India Company originally was just buying and selling. But in 1611, they had a problem with one of their trading partners in India. And they decided that the best way to solve this problem is to take over that trading post. And so now the East India Company has land and control of an area in India. The 17th century was the start of empiricism, so remember in the 16th century, we had humanism. We, care, we start to care about people even when it's not related to religion. Empiricism expands that to things and animals and plants. We really start to look at what is the world outside of the ideas of religion. The Bible has a story for how God created everything and has a story about what things are, are like and who has control. But sometimes the world does not fit the Bible. And empiricism is when people started to really look at the world. It does not mean they gave up religion. Religion is still very important. It just means they started to consider uh, the world around them. In 1616, Ben Johnson, the most important literary figure in the 17th century, who we will not read, publishes his literary work. This is important because in the 16th century, literature people thought that you should not publish. Literature is not something that's serious. It is something for fun. It is something to entertain the queen. It is something to build your reputation. It is not something to sell. But Ben Johnson decided, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to print it anyways. Now. He did not do this to sell his work. He did this, he said, so that history will remember his work. But how would history remember his work? By buying it. Um, but after Ben Johnson publishes his work, other literature people start to think, hmm, maybe I can also publish my work. And so it's the start of publishing literature in England. Now, in the 17th century, the kind of literature they cared about had wit, and it used more colloquial language, everyday language. Uh, 
you may not be able to tell that it's everyday language because it's everyday for the 17th century, not for today. Trust me when I say that their language is more like what they said in daily life. It is actually easier to understand 17th century poems. As you will see in two weeks. At this time, women also started writing poetry, at least that we know of from history. Uh, queen Elizabeth wrote some poetry, um, but she's the queen. So of course we think that poetry is important. But in the 17th century, we start to see women uh, who we today think are important solely because of their poetry and their writing. Uh, because of limits of time and, and space, we won't read any women poets, but just be happy to know that they exist. The 17th century is the century of the essay. Uh, we're going to read an essay in the 18th century. The 17th century is when the essays entered English literature. The essay as a literary form was basically invented in 1603 in French uh, in France by a guy named Michel de Montaigne. Montaigne. If you remember from high school, he's also a philosopher. The word essay means attempt. And what Montaigne was doing is he's trying to think on paper. Today, when we teach you to write, we say, think about what you want to write, make an outline, and then follow the outline when you write. But for Montaigne, he thought that people think differently when they think and when they write. So he wanted to see what his writing would bring him. So if you go to read his essays today, they are not very orderly. They are not very controlled. They kind of like go here and go there. It follows whatever he's thinking at the moment. This was huge. This was completely different. If you remember, um, prose works, Sanwenti Zoping, in the past were always about religion or politics. Montaigne is the first one to make prose personal. And it's not always about the idea. It's about the pursuit of the idea, the attempt to figure something out. Uh, sorry, he wrote this in 1580 in French. It was translated into English in 1603. Uh, so this is one root of the English essay. The other route is 1625. Francis Bacon uh, finalized the definitive edition of his own collection of essays. Bacon. In Chinese, we translate his name as Pagan for I mean, obviously, but like he's also a philosopher. He is often credited as the person who invented the scientific method. Or the scientific method, observe, hypothesis, jasa, experiment, uh, and then like conclusion, that kind of process. He so he is one of the most famous empiricists. He cared about what's going on in the world. He figured things out using experiment. So his essays are more about ideas. He has an idea. He writes about how do you figure out the truth of this idea? And then he does the experiment and he tells you what happened. So these are the two roots of the English essay. Personal, subjective, experimentation, and empiricist, scientific experimentation. Even today, we see these two kinds of English essays. Some essays are very personal about your own story, about things that you, you think about and you feel in your life. And some essays are very driven by the idea. This idea is very important. You should know why is it important? How does it affect you? Uh, but again, because essays are very long, uh, I did not include any for the 17th century. In 1625, James dies. His son becomes Charles I. Charles I is like James, but worse, except he's not as gay. 
Um, so he cares even more about being the person in control of his country. He spends even more money in his court. Think about this. Uh, so it's technically, Parliament, Guohui, is responsible for taxes, for bringing money into the country. But here you have a king who says, I am more important than Parliament, and I'm going to spend truckloads of money every day. That's kind of a problem, right? Parliament also thought this was a problem, so uh, this is the root, the the direct cause of the civil war. The We'll get to that very quickly. Um, so in the 1630s, this is what he's talking about. Rigid absolutism. I am the only person who matters and neglect of parliament. Specifically, not only does he not care about parliament, he never convened parliament after uh, like in the 1630s. It's the responsibility of the king to convene parliament, to gather everybody, to make sure of, uh, the country is doing well and to create laws. But in the 1630s, he did not convene parliament once. Uh, what he did do is his uh, loyal minister, William Laud, in 1633, appointed a new uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury is the second most powerful person in the English church. So in the Church of England, the head of the church is the king. But the king is busy. He can't do everything. So the person really in charge of the church is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Canterbury William Laud, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, so William Laud became the new Archbishop of Canterbury. And this is also a problem. Remember, the Church of England is Protestant. Protestant churches believe as long as you have the Bible and you believe in what the Bible says, basically you will go to heaven. There are some details in the middle. Uh, but in Catholicism, they think you have to follow the Pope, you have to do good stuff, lots of other things you have to do. When William Laud became Archbishop of Canterbury, he put more emphasis on those other things works, which means doing good things. And so people were scared that, wait, James I was Catholic. Charles says that he's not Catholic, but he chose somebody to control the church who looks very Catholic. And so this is also another reason people did not like Charles as king. So 1640, this parliament, like, you know, Lots of problems in the country. King Charles finally had no choice. He had to convene parliament. But here he's basically saying, uh, he basically called them in to say, you don't have to do anything. He's officially telling parliament to go fuck themselves. Uh, and so after that, um, parliament starts getting mad. They start trying to use their own power. In 1641, the first important thing they do is they stop censorship. If you remember in the 16th century, the government started controlling what people could publish. And they did this because they wanted to prevent other religions and other politics from spreading in the country. So why did parliament stop doing this? Because they wanted other politics and other religion to spread, to help them against the king. Uh, and so uh, by 1642, Parliament called people to join their new army. And they raised an army and they started attacking uh, the king's army. And that's the beginning of the Civil War uh, in England, 1642. Now, now that the two sides have been established, we no longer want new ideas. So in 1643, they restarted censorship again. Right. Like if you think of Mao Zedong, Bai Hua Qifang, and then later Zai Ge, same thing. Uh, so in the Civil War, uh, the two sides, one side is the king, tradition, royal power. The other side is parliament, uh, people's, uh, well not people, but like nobles, Guizhu, 
control of the country and more sensible government. Um, but really what the parliament wanted was to depose the king, which means to kill him. They wanted to start a republic, so a country with no king. So, you know, it's very messy, but for literature, what we care about is the kind of literature during the Civil War. Uh, and for some reason, the really important poets were all on the side of the king. Well, not not all of them, but a lot of them. So these poem, uh, these poets we call the cavaliers. They rode for the king, they fought for the king, they supported the king. And the kind of poetry they wrote is called carpe diem poetry. Carpe diem is Latin. It means seize the day. And the, the idea is everybody's fighting everybody. The world is ending. If you want to do something, you should do it now. And when they said something, what they really mean is have sex with me. They're all very bold love poems. Um, and I don't think we're going to read any. I, you've had enough of love poems for the next two weeks, um, but you should know that this is the most important kind of poetry on the king's side. On the parliament side, you have um, people like Andrew Marvell, who also wrote some carpe diem poetry. And then you have John Milton, who wrote the most important epic in English, Paradise Lost, Siloryan. Uh, usually an epic will tell the story of a country, but Paradise Lost tells the story of humanity according to the Bible. It begins chronologically. It begins before Adam and Eve. Uh, so Milton is really trying to tell the whole history of humanity according to his religion. Um, it's a long book. We don't have time to read it, but if you're interested, I do teach some of it next semester in uh, important uh, British important writers works and you can come and take that course if you want. By 1649, they managed to kill Charles I. And the person in charge of the country is Oliver Cromwell. He's not a king. He's a citizen and they call him Lord Protector. Huguo, uh, there's a name in Chinese, I can't remember. Something like that. So he's the guy who's in charge. Um, and what now that they have killed the king, why is the civil war still going on? Because other parts of the country don't agree. So now Cromwell has to fight Scotland, has to fight Ireland, all of this crazy stuff. And he's really good at fighting. He wins like every battle. The problem is that people at home are tired of fighting and they don't really, there are lots of new ideas, new religions uh, spreading at home and he slowly loses power at home while he's winning the battles abroad. And so he, uh, he dies, I think of natural causes in 1658. His son is very young, has no power. And so the supporters of the king of the royalty managed to overthrow his son and they instate the son of Charles I as the new king and call him Charles II. And that is the end of the English Civil War. So the 17th century is about exploring the world uh, around you, across the ocean, and about lots and lots of fighting. Questions? Okay, so for next week, read five poems by William Shakespeare. See you next week.